Okay, great. So we're ready. Our next speaker is doing, going to be Michelle Thompson from Omafra, and she's going to talk again about West Nile virus. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to start off by saying thank you to whoever organized the order of the presentations today because Sean did a great job of covering off some of the background information that I didn't have time to go through in my presentation, so it works out perfect. So my project was um, completed as part of an independent study course during my Master's of Public Health under the supervision of Dr. Olaf Burke in the Department of Population Medicine. So a little bit, this might be a little bit of repeating from Sean, but a little bit of an intro on West Nile virus. Uh, it's a vector-borne infection caused by a flavivirus. Other human infections caused by flaviviruses are dengue, yellow fever, and Japanese encephalitis. In Canada, mosquitoes and birds infected with West Nile virus were first detected in Ontario in 2001. The initial human cases in Canada were reported in 2002 in Ontario, Quebec and Alberta, although the case from Alberta was thought to have been related to travel. West Nile virus became a reportable disease in 2003 in Ontario. This graph shows the cases between 2002 and 2013, both confirmed um, and probable cases. So the yellow bars are confirmed, the blue ones are probable. So we can see that there is a, a big fluctuation in the number of cases, um, of almost 400 in 2002, down to only two confirmed cases in 2010, followed by another spike in 2012, where we had about 270 cases. As Sean mentioned, the mosquito species in Ontario that are involved in transmission are the Culex pippins and Culex rusterans. They act as a bridge species transferring West Nile virus from birds to humans. Uh, this species of mosquito is generally found in urban areas, so it presents a, a health risk to those living in urban communities. Birds act as an amplifier uh, host for the virus in Ontario, again, where, you know, the family of the Corvidae, so American crows, blue jays, and the common raven are most of, often involved in its transmission. Humans and horses are considered incidental and are dead-end hosts for the virus. A little bit here on disease mapping. Uh, it's very beneficial to public health practice as it can provide information on spatial patterns and help us to identify spatial risk factors uh, related to disease incidents. In the case of West Nile virus, it can be used to evaluate control methods, to help allocate resources, and to monitor changes in the disease over time. Previous studies have investigated the spatial risk distribution of West Nile virus in relation to things like dead birds, uh, positive mosquito pools, and other ecological factors such as vegetation density, uh, and using the scan statistic to do this. Which leads me to the scan statistic. So it's a tool to help us detect and evaluate clusters of disease, and this can be done in either a purely temporal or over time, uh, spatial, so looking at a geographic area, or in a space-time combination. For this test, uh, we gradually scan a window across either time and or space and note the number of cases, um, both observed and expected observations inside the window at each location. And multiple different window sizes are used uh, to do this. For this spatial scan statistic, the null hypothesis is that the expected number of cases in each area is proportional to the population size. So we might likely expect that as population increases, we're going to see more cases. For each location and each size of the scanning window, the alternative hypothesis is that there is an elevated risk within the window when compared to the area outside. The window with the maximum likelihood is the most likely cluster or the cluster that is least likely due to chance and a p-value is assigned to this cluster. So for this process to occur, we have to provide the program with some information. So we have to include uh, both case and population counts for a set of data and those locations. So these can be either um, counties, public health units, postal code areas, areas or um, census tracts. 
And then we also have to provide a file that tells the, the program the geographic coordinates of all of those areas. So for my study, we wanted to evaluate and compare the risk distribution of human cases of West Nile virus in Ontario in 2005 and in 2012. The objectives were to map the risk distribution of West Nile virus for both of those years, then identify clusters for both 2005 and 2012, and then to determine whether the location and the extent of those clusters differed for the years 2005 and 2012. So to do this, uh, as previously mentioned, West Nile virus is, is reportable in Ontario, so that really helped us. It um, means that cases are identified in two ways and they must be reported. So cases are typically either identified by healthcare professionals or through blood screening tests performed by Canadian Blood Services. Both confirmed and probable cases are reported to the public health units who then input case information into the Integrated Public Health Information System, or IFAS. The number of confirmed and suspected cases of uh, West Nile virus in humans are then included in the annual um, Public Health Ontario's annual vector-borne disease surveillance report. So we analyzed this case data to estimate the risk distribution of human cases of West Nile disease in Ontario in 2005 and 2012. We then generated choropleth or heat maps to show the spatial risk distribution and then use the scan test to determine or to detect and locate the disease clusters. And then lastly, we repeated the scan test on the 2012 human West Nile virus incidents, adjusting for the incidence rate from 2005 to do the comparison. So, two maps here. The one on the left shows the human risk incidence um, estimates for 2005. The one on the right shows the incidence for 2012. Uh, in 2005, high-risk areas for West Nile virus disease were located in the southern tip. So the areas, areas that are darker shaded are higher risk. So the southern tip of Ontario as well as in the Toronto Public Health Unit. While in 2012, the primary clusters were, or the highest risk areas, excuse me, it decreased in the southern tip, so in the Windsor area it went down, but seemed to increase in the, um, along the western shore of Lake Ontario. The areas that are outlined in blue are areas where there were significant clusters. So in 2005, on the left, the primary cluster was down in the Windsor and Chatham-Kent public health units. And then there was a secondary cluster at the Toronto, City of Toronto public health unit. So that one there. In 2012, the primary cluster actually moved to the Toronto public health unit area. So all of the sections here are actually one big cluster and it included the Niagara Region, City of Hamilton, Halton Regional, Haldeman Norfolk and City of Toronto Public Health Units. And then the secondary cluster for that year was down in the Windsor Essex um, and Chatham Kent Public Health Units. Now when we repeated the scan test for 2012 after adjusting for 2005, there was one significant cluster left at the Windsor-Essex um, Public Health Unit, so down at the very bottom there. So what does this all mean? So based on our results, we see a high incidence of West Nile virus infections um, for both years in the southern tip and the central areas of southern Ontario. After adjusting for the spatial cluster analysis in 2012 based on 2005 risk, the cluster in the Toronto area went away, but we still had a cluster left at that Windsor-Essex Public Health Unit. So with West Nile vi virus disease incidence was relatively stable in the city of Toronto, but in the Windsor-Essex Public Health Unit, the situation is compar comparatively worse in 2012 than it was in 2005. So although we expect some variation in West Nile virus incidence across different public health units in Ontario, uh, due to differences in vectors and other ecological conditions. These factors should remain fairly consistent within public health units year to year. Those things don't really change. Um, 
In addition to the ecological conditions, however, there might, may be other systematic changes occurring in public health units in the form of public health programs and prevention activities. Some of them were talked about by Sean, so larvicide uh, treatments and monitoring, monitoring mosquito pools, public health initiatives, and that kind of education initiatives and that sort of thing. So, you know, why, why are we still seeing this significant cluster in the Windsor-Essex um, public health unit? Uh, we hypothesize that this could be potentially due to um, perhaps a shortfall in West Nile virus programming in this public health unit in 2012 compared to 2005. Or alternatively, it's possible as well that prevention activities in other public health units across Ontario had significantly improved while sort of maintaining the status quo in um, the Windsor-Essex public health unit. So to conclude, we investigated West Nile uh, virus disease cluster locations during two years in Ontario when we had a warmer summer than usual, which led to a higher number of West Nile cases. After adjusting for cases of disease in 2005, the Windsor-Essex Public Health Unit remained as a significant cluster in 2012. So this persistent cluster indicates a level of disease that's higher than expected when compared to public health units, other public health units in Southern Ontario. So West Nile virus prevention and control initiatives, uh, along with the public health activities, should be reviewed in this area to see where improvements can be made to decrease risk to the population. Um, and work such as this could be repeated each year to help evaluate public health um, activities. And so at the beginning, talking about disease mapping and it's important to public health, it's really a great tool for, for evaluating programming and initiatives. Um, so this could help again to, to determine where more, more, more work may be required in the future. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you to Dr. Berg for his uh, guidance during this project. So any questions in the room? Yep. Thanks, that was a very interesting presentation. I guess one of the things that I'd point out as a third hypothesis is if we look at the accumulated, de accumulated degree days, yes. uh, the southwestern part of the province is generally the hottest part of the province. Have you looked at that? Because if you look at the data season by season, it's always the area that has the highest accumulated degree days. The Windsor Essex. Yeah. The Windsor Essex area, yeah. So there have been other studies that, that have looked at that. We didn't for this one, but there definitely are other studies that have looked at the temperature as a factor in, in risk and incidence in Ontario. Jen? I don't know. So I don't know if you could hear it. Yeah, so <laughs> Jan was wondering if there was any link um, as, and I'll try to say this properly, but as um, perhaps as white nose uh, syndrome has been affecting bats, that's decreasing the, um, I guess, predators for mosquitoes, and that might be in turn also leading to an increase in the number of mosquitoes. Am I getting that basically right? Yeah, yeah. so is there any link? Yeah, yeah, and I don't know. I'm not sure whether that's been studied or not. Other questions? Bats don't really eat a lot of mosquitoes. Okay. But uh, are there any, can you get any data from across the border? Because I know like Windsor does have control programs, but I'm pretty sure Detroit doesn't. So yeah. they, have a lot, they have a lot going on in Detroit and there's no control there. Is right. there a possibility of these sites where there was a spillover from Detroit? Yeah, I guess that would be possible. And, and the other thing too with with um, I guess the surveillance in general is we, we might not always know where, where the person became infected. Was it in that public health unit or was it from somewhere else? So travel is also a factor for sure. Other questions? I think we still have time for questions. Yes. Yep.
I haven't personally, but I think it, it's definitely used in that, you know, bringing in that temporal factor and either just looking at the, the time factor or, you know, using that combination of space and time for sure. It's, it, it is used, um, I don't know of any study specifically, but yeah, yeah. Other questions? If not, I may have a question. Again. Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, let, tell me if I missed something. Okay. But, uh, uh, you looked at 2005, you looked yes. at 2012. Yes. When I looked at the graph of the occurrence of West Nile virus over time in the province, cases in humans and so on, there is a huge variation from year to year. Yes. So how does that kind of variation influence your results and, and your assessment of trends? Mm -hmm. Well, for sure, it's Sorry. So, how would the difference in the number of cases from year to year influence the analysis that we did and the trends that we see? Um, you know, we we sort of selected the years 2005 and 2012 because there was an, you know a higher case level. It helped to kind of provide us with some uh, better data and made our data a little bit more reliable. So that's that's definitely why we selected those years. Um, there have been other studies that looked at that other at other years. I think one of um, Olaf's past students maybe compared 2002 to 2005. So in that study, um, there was definitely, if I'm remembering correctly, and I might not be, but I think for sure that area around the Toronto um, public health unit, sort of western edge of Lake Ontario, was was a hot spot then as well. So it seems to be pretty consistent. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we still have time. I don't see anybody from the other room coming in, so no? Okay, so we'll switch to the next speaker. Thanks a lot. Thank you.